Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people should be aware that this series may contain images, voices or names of deceased persons. Welcome to Susan Carland, In Conversation. This interview is a supplement to Episode 6 in the Australian Journey series, Captivity Narratives. I'm standing here in the convict female factory in Hobart, Tasmania. The place is in ruins now, and this site is so significant, it's listed as a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. These tall walls tell the tales of the many thousands of women who were incarcerated in this space between 1828 and 1856. I want to find out more about this, so I'm going to speak to Professor Ray Francis, Dean of Arts at the Australian National University and an expert on the experiences of colonial women. Ray, why were the convicts sent here to the female factory? Was it as an additional punishment on top of transportation to Australia? No, it wasn't um, an additional punishment usually, although in some cases it was. Um, most of the women who came through here came when they were transported, they got off the um, port in Hobart and they walked up the road here to the Cascades female factory. And it was where they were processed. They were sorted into classes, um, first class, second class, third class, depending on their behaviour. And from there, they were, if they were considered suitable, they were assigned. They were sent out as servants to the settlers. Um, so it was, it was really a, a holding kind of prison for um, much of its operation. But you did have women who had offended once they'd been assigned and they could be sent back in here for additional punishment. So it was both. So what were the conditions like for the women while they were here and what were they doing? Mm. The conditions here really varied depending on how you were classed. If you could be first class, you were considered much more responsible and you were given lighter duties, different kind of clothes, more responsibility. If you were third class, you were the worst. You were the crime class, they called those ones. And you were given hard work. You were put in the laundries, you were put to work, you know, often for 12 hours a day. It was hard work. But regardless of what kind of work you were doing, you, know, you were in overcrowded conditions most of the time. Sometimes there were three times as many women in this factory as they was intended to be. So um, there were women having to share hammocks. Um, it was really very unpleasant and it was stuffy, it was cold. Yeah. They weren't given adequate food and what they were given was really not very nutritious or interesting. Um, so for a lot of the time they were, were hungry, um, malnourished, they were cold, um, as well as the ones in the third class were working very hard. So that was pretty grim existence for them. Yeah. For the others, um, in the second class, they were put to work doing lighter work, such as sewing, um, and for them it wasn't so bad, and quite often they didn't have enough work to do, so their problem was often boredom, as with the women in the first class. So it was a hard one, I think, which was worse, being overworked or being bored. Right. Um, and how you experienced being in the factory depended not just on what kind of class you were in, but on whether or not you were a mother. So women were sent in here who were pregnant or had small children and those children were usually taken away from them. Mm. So they were separated from their children, which is, must have been very hard, I think, if, if you were one of those women. And quite often those children died because they again weren't cared for properly, they weren't properly uh, fed. Mm. And being in the close confines, unhealthy conditions, there was a scandalously high infant mortality rate in the factory. And all of the women, when they came in from the boats, had to endure the kind of stigma that was associated with being a convict woman. When they came through those gates, they had their head shaved as a marker that they were convict women. And it was obviously a sanitary measure as well to get rid of the lice, yeah. but it was something the women felt very keenly because it was an assault on their femininity. So uh, regardless of what class you were in, you know, it's never nice being in a prison, 
but for some women it was much worse than others. Right. Punishing if not a punishment. But having said that, even though the conditions were pretty awful, it's all a matter of relativities and a lot of the women actually preferred to be inside here in the prison than to be outside and it's partly because they made really strong friendships with the other women and they, they felt in many cases much safer being in here amongst a group of women than being outside where they were exposed to an overwhelmingly male population where they were vulnerable to all sorts of sexual assault and so on. So a lot of them deliberately re-offended so that they could be sent back in here. Wow. Ray, I've heard a lot about um, protests by the male convicts. Was there ever any instances of rebellion by the female convicts here? Yeah, no, there were lots of instances actually and it, it ranged from pretty um, sort of low-key disrespect, like they would make up songs about the supervisors, for example, and that really annoyed them. Um, but in other cases, they would um, light fires. There was a notorious incident where the men um, had sent food over the wall. They'd thrown bread and cheese and so on. And the authorities had confiscated it. And the women were so annoyed with that that they went to their rooms and set fire to their clothes. So that's just one little act yep. of protest. And there, there's another really famous episode where um, the governor um, and his wife were inspecting a group of convict women and they were upset about something. So as a group, they turned around, lifted up their skirts and bared their bottoms. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a different sort of protest. A to big the... mooning. Yes. <laughs> um, convict women have often been called the mothers of this nation. Do you think they've left any legacy in Australia and, and what would that legacy be? That's a really interesting question because it used to be that this was a very shameful part of our history, that for most of the 19th century, well into the middle of the 20th century, people were really hung up on the convict stain and the fact that this had left a, a really terrible legacy for Australia and the women were considered, by and large, to be whores, to be mm. prostitutes was the, the language of the time. And it's only been in the later decades of the 20th century that there's been a much more sympathetic view of convict women and they've been um, appreciated I think for the contribution they made to establishing white settlement in Australia. So they've been appreciated for their labour and as you said for their reproductive labour, for bearing the children. Um, so I think that's a really important shift in the legacy and people today see them I think more commonly as victims, as more sinned against than sinning, but also as um, women who were resourceful, assertive, resilient, um, as survivors. And it's something that I think a lot of people who have traced their own family histories um, actually draw strength from as, as a kind of model of femininity for modern Australian women. What became of the convict women once they left this place? Well, that's again hard to generalise about because there were you know, many, many different routes and destinies that women had. A lot of them, um, they left, they were assigned to um, settlers. A lot of them got married and once they were married, they effectively became free, at least from the law. They were then you know, bound to their husband. Um, a lot of them became um, independent women who set up their own businesses. So, um, and they contributed as entrepreneurs to early colonial society. And there are famous cases, not just in Tasmania, but in, in Sydney as well, of people like Mary Reby, for example, who ended up on one of our banknotes, uh, a very famous early entrepreneur. So they did contribute either as wives and mothers, um, or as workers, or as entrepreneurs. Some of them saved enough money and went back to England and some of them decided when they got back to England that actually they were better off in Australia and came back again. So they were very mixed destinies. And then of course there were the others who were never going to succeed and just kept reoffending and ended up here or in poverty. Mm. Professor Ray Francis, thank you so much for joining us today in the Cascades Female Factory here in Hobart, Tasmania. My pleasure, Dr Carland. <laughs>